Welcome, everybody. I'm Anna Oakes, editor of Courts at Work here, and I'm so glad that you all have made time to join the conversation today as we focus on the advancements in workplace technology and how companies can keep up, which is desperately needed. So we are going to cover two housekeeping items before we get started, um, actually three. So the first one is, uh, please, we're asking everybody to manage your own microphone and your video and keep those turned off. Um, but we'd also love you to be engaged in the conversation. And so we have um, an area where you can drop your questions. So in Zoom, you would click on the Q&A box. A lot of people will be chatting in our chat function, which I think is brilliant. Um, but what we really wanna make sure we're doing is putting our questions that we have either for me or the panel in that Q&A box so that we can really track um, and keep track of all of those throughout. The last one is closed captioning. So we do have closed captioning enabled today. And so if you want to view that or turn that off, you can look down. There's a little box at the, the toolbar of Zoom at the bottom with the CC, the closed captioning it says live transcript. You can uh, select to show the subtitles there or change your subtitle settings as well. So I think that's all of our housekeeping today. I'm joined by um, Julia Kramer and Julie Hansen, who will both be helping out both in the Q&A and with any maybe te technical difficulties that we have today, which would be ironic given our topic. So let me give you an overview of what we're gonna talk about today. Um, I have heard it said recently that any company that has pushed past the last two plus years can now call itself a tech company. Um, that might be a stretch in some frame or fashion, but companies are certainly waking up to how technology can not only serve their company, but their people too. Uh, so the expectations of today's talents and customers, right, mean that regardless of whether we have all returned to the office, we're working hybrid in an in environment, oh, excuse me, we're working in a hybrid environment, or perhaps we're all remote, technology is the key to sustaining and growing our impact as organizations. So let's meet the lineup today. So first from Red Thread Research, we have Danny Johnson. She's the co-founder and principal analyst for Red Thread, and she spent the majority of her career writing about, conducting research in, and consulting on human capital practices and technology. So before starting Red Thread, Danny led the learning and career research practice at Burson Deloitte, and she shares some of her thought leadership in publications such as the Wall Street Journal, HR Magazine, and more. Danny holds a Master of Business Administration, Master of Science, and a Bachelor of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering from Brigham Young University. I'm really excited to talk with Danny today about Red Thread's research specifically on how employers can build connection through technology and the necessary quest of moving from roles to skills within organizations. Next up is Intel. Stephanie Halford is uh, Vice President and General Manager of Business Client Platforms at Intel. She's an accomplished tech executive with more than two decades of global experience spanning business operations, sales, marketing, product management, and communications. Stephanie has spent the bulk of her career living globally including multiple leadership roles in China and Hong Kong, which I'm super jealous of, wish we could have a whole hour to talk about later. She holds a bachelor's degree in international affairs and humanities from the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. And we're gonna be chatting about what is needed to maximize the return on technology investments, addressing the unique technology challenges of hybrid work, and how to finally get our internal teams aligned on tech issues and needs. Multiverse. Uh, here we go. So Sophie, excuse me, Sophie Reddick is the vice president and general manager of North America at Multiverse, and she's a former impact investor and consultant with 10 plus years of experience across the private, public, and nonprofit sectors. As a founding member of Multiverse, Sophie is now leading their expansion to New York City, and her entrepreneurial and results-driven approach help her work at the intersection of people and tech to create impact at scale. Sophie and I are going to share more about the soft skills and the data skills that all employees need and how to prolong the shelf life of those tech skills and training. Um, and I specifically know that she believes we shouldn't lower the bar to hire talent, but we should be widening the gate to get to the right talent in our organizations. And Multiverse is doing some amazing work around apprenticeship models, which we're going to be talking more about. And lastly, a quick note uh, that Larry Gadea, CEO of Envoy, who was also set to join us today, unfortunately will not uh, be, uh, be joining us due to illness. So I'm sure you all join me in welcoming, uh, wishing him a speedy recovery. 
So let's get started by having Danny Johnson join me on stage. There Hello, we go. happy to be here. <laughs> Hello, welcome, welcome. So Danny, um, you know, look, far before the pandemic, employees were experiencing a loss of connection. Um, and really, I've heard a lot about those feelings and felt them myself of loneliness, isolation, and disconnection. Um, I know that your research has shown that enabling that connection continues to be key in the workplace, specifically um, that employees have a responsibility to build connection. Leaders set the tone for it more broadly, but then it comes to the system, which is the organization yeah. itself. I'm curious, how can employers leverage technology to build that connection and increase meaning? Yeah, I, I just wanted to start by saying, I think this is probably more important now than it's ever been. Uh, we used to have opportunities together around the proverbial water cooler, whether or not we had an actual water cooler. And that has kind of gone away as organizations have found more comfort with virtual uh, and, and remote work as well as hybrid work. And so, Technology is increasingly the way you connect with people that you work with. It is the way you connect. If you think about us, for example, we're all in different parts of the country. We're coming together to, to get a piece of work done, and that's what technology actually helps us to do. We think um, we never think that technology is the solution to any problem. I mean, there are many facets of connection, but um, we do see things that organizations are doing. And, and quite frankly, there are, kind, there are new types of technologies that are actually helping people connect better as well. I love that. What, what are some examples of those new technologies that you've been seeing, Dan? Yeah. Well, for example, we've seen a huge uptick in coaching technologies. Uh, mm -hmm. Coaching used to be a one on one sort of activity that you, you know, somebody in the back room had a book of coaches and they picked one and called them up and connected them with yeah. a leader or somebody that needed the coaching. But that's not necessarily how it works anymore. If you think about, um, I mean, we did a study last year on just coaching technology. We thought we'd see about 12 or 13, and we ended up with over, over 50 coaching technologies out there that are trying to help people connect either with um, coworkers internally or with coaches on the outside that can help them sort of, you know, improve what they're doing at work. But um, organizations are investing in coaching that the number two reason that they mentioned after improvement in, in performance was, was connection was engaging those employees and helping them connect to the organization and to other humans, which I think is a little bit of a change from the way that it was used before the pandemic. I think so too. And even just the mere fact that we're focusing on coaching more, yeah. obviously technology is helping us helping us do that. But but look, as a people practitioner myself for the last 17 years and Quartz's former head of people, I know that we need that day-to-day, -day, week to week, quarter to quarter coaching, and we can't rely just on our leaders, right? It takes a, a team. And so I'm really glad to see that that technology is going to be enabling that more. Yeah, for sure. A couple of other examples, if you if you have a second. Um, we're seeing uh, organizations collect more information about skills. There's a gigantic skills discussion going on right now. Um, how do we use skills data to, you know, move people to the parts of the organization they need to be in and all that good stuff. But some of the other things that we're seeing with skills is that skills are allowing us to create a more personal uh, relationship with the people that we serve. If you think about, I always use Amazon as an example. I have a fantastic relationship with Amazon. They have my credit card information. They know exactly what I need. They're, I am connected to Amazon in ways that I wish I were not. Um, and organizations are kind of following the same playbook there. If they have information about their employees, the skills that they have or the skills that they want, they're able to create really personalized learning opportunities for them. They're able to provide their managers with more information so that they can have deeper, richer conversations about it. And they're able to provide that information to the individual themselves so that they can do something with it, which I, I really kind of love. I think that's great. And we're going to keep talking about this, like moving away from roles into skills. And so the yeah. fact that technology is helping us do that is pretty amazing. Um, uh, another thought here, Danny, really organizations, I, I, I think, are waking up uh, in a lot of ways over the past few years. But really, one of them is starting to realize the benefits of quantifying work more granularly. Um, and really where I'm thinking there is, is your research has shown that there is increased value for organizations that think in terms of those skills rather than roles. So yeah. with that shift, um, that's a big undertaking, right, inside companies. So I, I'm curious, how have you seen companies leverage technologies to truly make that shift tactically from roles to skills? They have to. They have to use technology. It's such a gigantic challenge, and it changes basically every facet of how we deal with people in our organizations. Um, so they have to use technology. 
We recently have talked to about 25 leaders and talked about how they're implementing a skilled structure within their organization. And not one of them said that they were doing it without, without technology. Mm -hmm. um, another interesting fact, the tech market seems to be ahead of most organizations on skills. So we started hearing skills from the tech market five years ago um, when it was still sort of a, an idea that not many organizations were sort of glomming onto. Our recent research on the tech, the skills tech space also shows that um, while most organizations are starting to think in terms of skills, they're not using anywhere near the capability that's available by the technologies in order to implement this in. So, yeah. What's the gap there in, in that, like, you know, we're starting to see the skills, but we aren't using the, the total capabilities. Well, part of it is just the structure of organizations. If you think about how we've done things, we've done the same, we've done it the same way for 150 years, right? We we have put as basically an assembly line in place and we organize the work around the people structure that we have in our organization. And this kind of uproots all of that. We're no longer, you know, if organizations that are going to embrace this fully need to rethink how we account for a person, for example. Right now it's a head that belongs to a financial budget. In the future, if if we're going to organize people around the work instead of work around the people, we can't think about it that way. And so if you think of all of the systems and processes in the organization that supports our current structure, skills can uproot all of that. And it just takes a minute for us to think about how we're going to do it differently and how we can actually take advantage of the skills. Yeah, my hope is that maybe by focusing on the skills work, and using technology to really enable that, Danny, that we're also going to see companies start to strengthen or even clarify their foundational concepts like their mission and their vision, because those skills need to be aligning to the priorities that we have inside an organization. I actually love that you said that, because I think that's another thing that skills allows us to do. We, When we were talking to these organizations, they're not willy-nilly saying, hey, we're going to, we're focusing on skills because we think this large upheaval is a fantastic thing to do for our organization. They're actually thinking about how those skills are going to get them to where they need to go. And so if you have individual information about what an individual can do in your organization, you have that sort of rolled up to the, the top of the organization, then you know where your skills gaps are. And if you are using the right skills technology and have benchmarking data on the outside, you also know how much it's going to cost you to get the skills that you need into the organization. And so all of that information provides you sort of an overview of where you sit and what it's going to take to get there, but also allows you to think more creatively about maybe where people could sit or which skills go across different functions and all of that kind of stuff that we just don't have visibility to right now because we're thinking in terms of roles. Mm, yeah, so here we have better skills, better foundations, better priorities, right? right. And so now we're we're not only getting better at honing in on what the individual skills we need, but that's going to help us get better at prioritization for the for the organization. I think something related to that, Danny, is is the effect or, or impact on our our quests as many companies with diversity, equity, and inclusion. Do you think there's yeah. a connection there? Yeah, I, I kind of I lo I love that too. Um, one of the things that we know is that some of the systems and processes that we've had in place with respect to how we compensate people and how we promote people are very biased. If you think about a nine box grid, for example, or a high performance a hypo uh, program, they're really biased because what happens is somebody will come into the organization, usually hired because they look by the look similar to the person that's coming into that organization. They um, are seen as a rock star in their first you know year or year and a half working there. They get put on some list as, as a hypo or put in the you know the upper right hand corner of that nine box grid and they stay there forever. They camp out and it takes a lot of time and effort to realize that maybe that person isn't a rock star. But if we start gathering, gathering information about skills and if we know what people are learning, what people are seeking for, if we are looking at people that are volunteering for opportunities in talent marketplaces, for example, then we have a much better handle on what, what, what jobs people can actually do, what work they can actually do. And we're not relying on our gut to determine whether or not somebody would be good in a situation. And so that I think sort of levels the playing field that desperately needs to be leveled, by the way, um, to allow people of color and people who have maybe been I don't want to use the word oppressed, but maybe a little bit oppressed in organizations uh, to have opportunities that they haven't had before. Yeah. One of the things I think about DNA with organizations is that I don't expect perfection. I mean, I'm somebody who, who you know, agitates a lot and, and expects uh, organizations to be making progress, right? And so I don't expect that the grass is greener on the other side. It's a different color and there will always be dog poop in the yard because it is run by humans. And so we're fallible, we're human, we can get used to that, but we need tools to help us yeah. help us sort of skip over the, the bias that can happen in the workplace, all those learned behaviors that we've had through decades of the antiquated work system. Yeah, exactly. 
Uh, curious to next, if I could sort of shift a little bit um, to some of those best practice ways that companies can actually leverage the technology. I know there's people we want to be as tangible as we can who are on the line today, because that technology can really be leveraged to attract, to develop, to retain and engage their workforce as a whole or as individual employees. What are some of those best practice ways you might be finding in your research or your talks with companies? Yeah, I think unfortunately my answer is not going to be sexy, but I'll give you I'll give you I'll give you three that I think are important. The first one is to design for your own company. We've talked to a lot of organizations that are like, hey, you know, give me the framework I need to put skills or leverage technology for connection within my organization. And it doesn't really work that way. There are so many factors that affect your culture and how you communicate and how you connect. It's really a do-it-yourself job. You got to figure out what works for your organization and do it. The second one is to look internally first. A lot of times, especially uh, HR practices, tend to look uh, for special or shiny technologies that do certain things. Um, one really good example is if you want people to learn from each other, they'll go out and buy a learning technology that allows you to uh, message other people to learn. Why? If everyone's already on, on WhatsApp, leverage WhatsApp to, to make sure that you know, you're getting what you need. And then the third piece of data, sorry, the third piece of advice is data. Use data. We have more data than we've ever had. We're using technologies that generate a ton of data and that data can be fed back into those same technologies to make the experience better. Use data to decide what kinds of technology um, and how effective those technologies are within your organization. Is there one piece of data, Danny, that like is readily accessible to most organizations, regardless if they have a really fancy you know, human capital uh, system that, that we should just be leveraging more or differently even? I think just the communication tools that we use, you know what I mean? I was at a, I did a presentation in a large organization this week and they said that they really appreciated Zoom. We hear a lot about Zoom fatigue and those types of things, but they appreciated the opportunity to see kids running through the background and, and you know, connect in ways that maybe they hadn't before because it has become acceptable now. And so my biggest piece of advice was to use what you have and, and especially those communication tools, Zoom, Slack, Teams, whatever it is you use. Yeah, and listen, if your organization is, is having Zoom fatigue, you should to do an audit, how how many meetings right. are we having unnecessarily, right? Yeah. Tools you have. Don't host Zoom happy hours, right? right? Use Zoom to actually get your work done better because that's what creates your culture. That's what how you operationalize what you're trying to achieve. I kind of love that. Don't blame the technology, blame the systems that are using the technology. Right, right. And I loved your second point about leveraging the tools we have. If I could go back to your first point and just ask a quick question there about building the organizational awareness through self and other. Um, I'm going to follow back up on that and, and put that at the end, Danny. So if we could okay. put a pin in that, that would be really great. Sure. Okay, yes, awesome. This has been a really great start to this, Danny. We're going to bring you back for the group panel in a little bit. But right now, I'm going to welcome um, Stephanie Halford to the stage. Hi. Hi. Yeah, it's good. Waiting for my tech to, tech to keep up there. Welcome, welcome. So Liz, my first question, I, I'll start us off with an, an easy one, and we can all insert our eye roll here because there's nothing easy about what we're talking about today. But technology really is a tool that I, I look at as a way to help improve collaboration and achieve our goals as a company. Um, all the clarity that we just talked about with Danny is certainly important, um, but often companies see the tool as the answer versus identifying what else needs to change uh, within the company's operating system to ensure uh, success, right? So I'm curious from your perspective, and it's it's pretty broad here. Um, to prevent this, what behaviors and processes should a company focus on to maximize their use of this technology and truly embed it into their day-to-day -day operating system? Yeah, it's such a great question. And, and I think um, what's so interesting is, is now that we're all living it, it allows us to have a personal perspective, which is sometimes, you know, it, when I'm I'm asked to discuss technology, et cetera, you end up realizing you're relating to a very small portion. Now that we're talking about hybrid work and hybrid living, um, it actually affects all of us. You know, even those that are not working, it's how they're communicating with relatives, et cetera. So it allows us to kind of, um, I think, have a more personal um, interface with this type of, with this topic, which is great. I think number one, you know, the tools themselves are, um, need to be addressed in the environment which they create. So the first thing that the company needs to do, and if you look back at, you know, speaking of our personal experiences, two years ago prior to the pandemic, it was quite simply, you know, just being 100% remote. Did you have Wi-Fi connectivity and a decent enough camera? Mm -hmm. That was it. Then you started to realize, okay, 
companies needed to help their employees upgrade those home environments. So you started saying, okay, we many companies were giving budgets for stand up sit stand desks yeah. and uh, you know LED rings and lighting and better cameras, better microphones. So you were creating a better experience, workplace experience at the home. You were companies were taking um, responsibility for that instead of just saying, hey, you got your laptop at home, you're on your own. Now, two years later, we've come full circle and companies are actually trying to bring those tools um, and that same environment into the office because you're still going to have some online, some in the office. Right. And so, you know, that's where I'll come back to some of the behavioral things that we need to do. But, you know, again, in the office setting, companies are saying, okay, how do I create a means of having the uh, person online and the person in those four of us in the room creating a balanced environment so that one is not being left out or you can't see the people in the room because the room cameras are not the same as they are with close up uh, cameras. So there's a lot of, I think, companies are actually realizing that, you know, they started with creating a better work experience in the home. Uh, they started then realizing they needed to, to transfer that work experience outside, and then they needed to actually set up offices in a different way, more collaborative way. And uh, in fact, they're needing to almost incentivize employees to come back to the office. Yeah. You know, there are those that, that uh, miss being in the office, you know, in, in, in my team, it's a lot of the folks that have young kids, you know, because the kids don't respect the closed door and want to come in and mommy and daddy, you know, wanting the attention. And so a lot of those that have less flexibility want to be in the office. Um, and it's just also a style thing. There are certain, certain things that are better together, you know, live. Mm -hmm. um, so companies are having to really rethink those work environments at home, at, at the office, as well as having accomplished it at home. Yeah. So number one, I think the mindset and the behavior that needs to happen with companies is flexibility, just a flexible mindset that we're now not working for one size fits all. And once I think everyone gets their, you know, the, the leadership gets their ears and, and arms and minds around that, you start then coming up with what processes do you need to adapt? So you, you set up, you know, these different environments. Now, what processes do you have to do? At Intel, we've recognized, you know, the number one reason want, we want to be together in the office is the social connection. So it's feeling the trust with those coworkers, you know, and trust is incredibly important in the world today, but, you know, less so in the office. And that's only really built one-on-one -on -one or, you know, group can be group, can be multi, but it's really built face-to-face. -face. And so we make sure that the days that we try to pick to be in the office together, and it's not mandatory, you can say, okay, Wednesdays is the day we tend to have more brainstorming meetings. So let's be, you know, let's aim for Wednesdays as the as the in office day. If you had to choose only one, that would be the one we'd recommend. And then we try to put a social event, perhaps, again, optional at the end of the day. And because spending is tight, everyone is, you know, demand has really decreased um, in the second half, given all of the geopolitical and fiscal issues going on. We've, you know, said, OK, well, optional to meet at XYZ restaurant or bar and, you know, happy hour. Make that on the same day that everyone's already down in, you know, in the office. So that's proved to be really popular because it allows people to have those brainstorm whiteboarding times together building some trust and then getting, you know, out, which we used to do after work or have a lunch together or that kind of thing. So that's been a big behavioral change that has gone along with, you know, setting up the technology, the tools and the environments. Yeah. Um, I would say the other one is, I think I mentioned this earlier, we found that not all of the meeting rooms have the you know, the appropriate camera that tracks the speaker, pulls away at the right time, et cetera. And so those at home can't read body language, you know, of, of people in the room. And uh, they also cannot, you know, jump in. So you're awkwardly talking over each other, that kind of thing. So we're trying to, even if you're in the office and you're in a collab room, you need to have your personal camera on as well so that there's a you know, playing field right yeah yeah 
And um, so, you know, everyone's working through all, all that, but those are some, some things that we're doing and we're saying, look, for staff meetings, for instance, where you're going through more operational process oriented topics, not whiteboarding, those are fine on Zoom or Teams. You know, that that might not warrant being in the office. Uh, it might, you know, the office would be more of a brainstorming strategy setting session. Um, and so we're trying to pick and choose what meetings are better live and what ones need to be, yeah. you know, together. And that theme so, Stephanie, of, your, of, of what you shared so far to me is about intentionality, right? You know, often when we gathered before this all happened, <laughs> pre-pandemic, we, we weren't as intentional. Why are we meeting? Who needs to be there? What's the general energy or vibe of that space? And so to me, I'm hoping that we stick with that as companies. And for those that are really, really um, choosing hybrid work or even all remote, I, I think it's going to be a requirement. And, and for those of you who are bringing everybody to the back to the office, don't miss this opportunity to still still create intention about how you gather. I think that's going to be really important. Um, let me move to a different angle here, um, Stephanie. We're going to discuss hybrid work. So, so let me bring in the audience. So if, if you're all um, actively listening here, let's pull our energy. Um, and we're going to share a poll. Um, let's pull, pull back in this first polling question. So while Julia shares that, Stephanie, this question is around what percentage of our workforce um, uh, over 50% uh, works over 50% of their time remotely. So we're curious about those of you in the audience, because that's really going to help us um, answer these next two questions that we've got planned for Stephanie. Uh, so, so really, Stephanie, with today's workplace, as everybody's answering this question, we're now seeing companies move to, to all remote work, work to be hybrid or commit to that full return to the office. What are the unique challenges of technology? Um, let's go specific to um, hybrid just for the case of time. Mm -hmm. Well, the things that we're focused on, so obviously we are a silicon company, you know, the brains in the computer and, you know, number one is the hardware that we produce. And I think what uh, we, so what can we affect on, on our own? At Intel, there's a few things like my personal spaces, I run uh, the Intel vPro platform, which is the number one business PC in the world today. Very large penetration in large enterprises globally. Uh, as well as many small and medium business. And the reason why that's true is we've embedded actual hardware-based security. So as you open that laptop, there are capabilities built into the hardware that can be supplemented by software. We work with Windows Defender, we work with CrowdStrike, many of the key security providers for businesses and we ensure that we're able to interlock the software and the hardware to provide a more secure environment. An example is um, with CrowdStrike, for instance, you are able to, we have hardware-based counters that detect crypto jacking and ransomware or any anomalous behavior that's happening in the system. And we're able to lock down, we alert the software, in this case, CrowdStrike, and we'll start to lock down or encrypt the memory or other aspects we can talk to the OS so that an attack stops and no more destruction is, is required. And then through CrowdStrike, they'll go in and reme remediate, fix and plug those vulnerabilities. And that's not possible on a regular consumer computer. This is built into our vPro business computer and enabled with key security uh, providers. So these are the types of things that Intel can do. We also uh, work on our Wi-Fi. We're one of the leading Wi-Fi providers in the world. And one of the big issues that we're all having, either at the office or at home, is that connectivity can vary. Mm -hmm. And if you have a gaming teenager, you know, you want to be able to prioritize that Wi-Fi connectivity going to this Zoom call where mom is on camera versus, you know, the gamer in the next room. And so we have a, you know, Intel connectivity performance suite. Think about it as a traffic controller for Wi-Fi. And that traffic controller can be programmed to know, okay, always prioritize mom on Zoom and not the kid on games. And oh. there's a lot of these things you, that You've gotten me already, Stephanie. As a mom of twin tweens <laughs> who are in sixth grade, I have felt that connectivity issue. And so I 
I think the yeah. value of looking at for a hybrid workforce, I mean, look, it's complicated. Sometimes it's easier to go all remote or all in person, but honestly, that's not really what a lot of our companies need. So we're, we're going to look at hybrid. So security and that remote manageability are going to be really important for us. Um, can we look at the survey results here, Julie, if you could put those up, I'm just curious to see over half of the work. Okay. All right. Yes. Yeah, so we've got a really large percentage there at the bottom 80 to 100 percent where their workforce is over half of the time remotely. So that leads me to the second polling question. Julia, if we could put that up for everybody. Um, Stephanie, just for the sake of time here for, for your section, I'll ask the question while we're putting that next polling question up around um, technology. Uh, capabilities of technology is, is what I should say there. Uh, so the, the question I'd love for you to address here, um, probably in a minute or two, Stephanie, um, what's that one behavior as we look at the uh, technology capabilities, but what's the one behavior that we should be encouraging throughout the company that promotes collaboration in that hybrid environment? The, you know, I do think the behavior that I, um, I would argue is again, making sure that I think you're getting on video. There are times when you have, yeah. let's call it tens and twenties of people that are on a call that it is fine for everyone to be off. But what we try to do is role model being on video because I know this is just human. When I'm off, that's when I'm multitasking and I'm e catching up on emails. I'm doing other things. When I'm on video, I'm very aware that um, either I'm being seen as listening, paying attention, et cetera. So I think, you know, the behavior that we try to encourage and, and, and there is fatigue on that. It's not one size fits all. But in general, if you're needed to be in that meeting, you should be present in that meeting. Yeah. And so, you know, turning on the video, we also do things like we now have staggered meetings to five after or 10 after so that right. folks can go and get a cup of coffee, take care of something, come back and be present. Uh, and those are a couple things that we have found really successful, you know, at Intel and how we're driving a lot of collaboration tools and experiences into our, you know, our offerings to enable that. I think that's great. Yes. Permission to not have our camera on, please. We need to be doing more of that. So thanks, Stephanie. Um, and while we transition here, Stephanie, um, I'm going to have them show the polling results. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're going to bring you back on, uh, back up here in a little bit for our group panel. Um, but let's look at these technology capabilities. It looks like communication and collaboration tools are, are up there at the top of the list, which isn't surprising based on what we've heard from both both Danny and Stephanie today. So we're going to keep an eye on, on, uh, on this and bring you back up here in a little bit. So let's switch over to Sophie Ruddock of Multiverse and bring her on stage here. Um, Sophie, thanks for joining. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, all right. Let's jump right in it here for the sake Great. of time. Thank you. So, so how do you see technology really helping us to assess and hire talent in the future differently than we do now? Yeah, this is something that we get very excited about because so often I think hiring is still based on using college as a proxy for intelligence or job competence. And so often hiring managers are looking at things, yeah, like pedigree, what your GPA was, where you went to school, really over, does someone have the potential to not just do the job today, but in the future, what are their core skills? And so I think there's a huge role that technology can play in really leveraging how you assess people for potential over pedigree um, and also how it can help individuals show their strengths in an application, but also react to areas of growth. So in practice, how I see that looking is assessment for attributes like grit, conscientiousness, interpersonal skills, but we also use things like situational judgment tests to assess for these core competencies, so removing a lot of the bias. And then I actually think there's a lot of potential um, for the role of machine learning, um, assuming it is built in a sort of meaningful way with the right checks and balances so that you can better assess the match for someone in a role. Um, and I think that starts to get really interesting because it also starts to look at past performance, past experiences, but much more out of the box. So when you're thinking about data analytics, has someone demonstrated critical thinking? That might have been actually through being a store manager, but they've been you know, managing the books and having to problem solve live on the job and therefore have the attributes of success. So lots around the role of technology to assess for talent. And then I'm also seeing, and this was a big theme that came out from both Danny and Stephanie, the role 
of technology as businesses really move to you know move in this age of digital transformation and so um there are sort of two other things that I think you can start to see. Um, and I'll make a shameless plug for apprenticeships, which is what we do. Um, but apprenticeships um, can provide businesses with a way of really upskilling and hiring their future leaders. So both identifying talent that you wouldn't otherwise reach through the competency-based, skills-based hiring that I mentioned, but also enable businesses to actually build that capacity and capability through that on-the-job training so that people can start to add value right away. Um, and the added benefit of that is that you really start to make genuine progress against DE&I goals as well and building much more representative workforces um, all through just shifting how you hire and how you advance individuals. Yeah, and I, I'm just loving this theme of moving away from roles and looking at skills because it's it's been needed for so long. And and I know, look, tech skills are not just for tech, right? So uh, if we could get your opinion, just as you dive in deeper here, Sophie, what are those general technology skills that our listeners today, these leaders of these companies, should be thinking about outside of the IT department? So. I love that. Tech skills aren't just for tech. Um, every business today um, has gone through rapid digital transformation. And I would say really every business, government, department, nonprofit is in lots of ways a tech company now. Um, and so I think that the, I'd break it out into soft skills or what I actually call durable skills. And then also those harder data skills. Um, I think if we were going to do one of these polls, um, what we would see is that the majority of people on this call would request soft skills um, or durable skills above hard skills. Um, and so what I think of when I think of durable skills are skills like communication, teamwork, upwards management, stakeholder management, navigating through ambiguity. And those are it's the hard skills that people are often hired for, and it is the durable skills that people are often fired for, and so, or the lack of. And so I think it's incredibly important that there's a big focus on the ongoing development of these durable skills so that businesses are not just preparing for what they need today, but are actually developing people into what we call T-shaped individuals, a broad set of generalist skills that can adapt, enable them to adapt, as well as that deep subject specialism, which is where I think of sort of tech skills are no longer something that is just for the IT or technology department, but actually data skills in particular are just so important for any person in a, in a professional role, no matter what department you're in. And We've seen really interesting examples, um, one with actually a large construction company where they saw a lot of their sort of sales team and engineers more broadly were losing lots of time, hours every single week through just using manual, doing manual tasks of something that could be very simply automated. And so rather than relying on a central data team to field all these requests, actually what they said was, we're gonna upskill this entire, our entire workforce in data literacy so that what we can do is every team member can be enabled to you know, do some you know, high level analysis and basic automation to extract those insights. So that when you then do go to your IT department, your tech department, your data department, you're using them for the machine learning and the, the much more, the much more advanced skills. And where I get really excited about that is you start to spread, you start to spread the competencies, you start to spread the capability across the organization um, so that everyone is gearing up for the future of work rather than it just being outsourced to a very small select group of individuals. Oh, agreed. And I know there's a case study that you had out the WGSN. So, so we'll link back to that, Sophie, as we hear, as we share this back to our to our readers. Um, and I love what you're saying. I think I got this right. First of all, that T individual is so amazing. And I think that's a great visual even for us to have in our head. Um, but, you know, I, I, did I hear this right? We're hired for those hard skills, but we're fired for those durable skills, right? I think that's a great way to summarize a lot of where we need to get away from. So let me move on to the next question here, Sophie, to get your 
perspective, you mentioned the apprentices, apprentice model that you um, leverage with you and your clients. And I think that's so amazing. So it might be an expansion on the apprentice model or even how do we, like what's the gateway to, to start out? How do we adapt maybe some of those habits of an apprentice model internally? Um, so we might wanna go there, but really I'm looking for, is there a way either through that apprentice model or another habit that we can make the, the, the training and the skills that we're investing large amounts of money and time in last longer. Yes. Um, so I think that one of the main reasons why corporate training on the whole doesn't stick is because you're put in a classroom for two days a week, taught a lot of new skills, concepts, and theories, and then your company goes, okay, done, you must be a data analyst. Um, that was definitely my experience when I went on my first data program. And so where I see the value of apprenticeships, but more generally sort of on the job training is this, this, this concept of applied learning. And applied learning can really be even more effective than classroom learning because of the fact that you are learning a concept and then you are able to apply it on the job almost immediately. And so I think there's a stat that says about 7% of information that you're taught in a classroom is retained, which means you lose 93%. Whereas what you see with this applied learning concept, you learn how to you know, do a little bit of data analysis and then you go that same afternoon and do it in your job, then you learn a bit more and then you apply it in your job, you actually see that almost 100% of that knowledge is transferred to your ability to do it on the job. So I think the idea of a single shot of learning as a silver bullet, um, it just doesn't, it just doesn't work. And so the apprenticeship model provides that structure around full-time work, but also coupled with the both hard, hard skills, durable skills, and then importantly, the focus on the application of the learning on the job so that individuals get the value, they're learning skills, they're progressing, but also, and as importantly, businesses get the value as well, because you're able to demonstrate in real time, improve productivity, time saved on manual tasks, um, and sometimes even, you know, new multi-million dollar business ideas as a result of new team members having these skills. So even for an organization that can't go all in on an apprenticeship model yet, we can start to sort of adopt some of those behaviors that says like, just because we give somebody training doesn't mean that it sticks, right? They're going to need refreshers. They're going to need additional um, opportunities to apply that in a really timely way. And I think that's really where organizations could, can keep up their commitment to mm -hmm. their employees better. Definitely, I completely agree. Um, and also that the needs of the workforce are constantly changing. So I think it's 85% of the jobs that will exist in 2030 don't yet exist today. And what that will then mean is relying on sort of a single shot as a one size fits all will just mean that these skills become outdated very quickly as well. Yeah. Agreed. Okay, Sophie, thank you so much for this time. I'm going to bring everybody back on stage now, Julie. So if you can help me with that, welcome back, Stephanie um, and Danny to the stage. We will open this up for a larger group conversation here. Um, and we've had questions flowing into the Q&A, but if you haven't had a chance to do that, please use that question and answer, excuse me, question and answer function um, within Zoom um, to drop your questions in. I've been tracking those along the way. Um, and let me just see if I can start us out in this in this panel discussion um, with one to, to see where the group will will sort of take this. Um, you know, Envoy, um, and this, this this is really great research that just came out of their at work report that dropped yesterday. Um, they showed that 96% of leaders take notice of an employee's work contributions more often when their employees come to the office. And so we've been reading a lot about that proximity bias that can can exist. And I, I mean, as myself, I'm a 100% remote employee in a hybrid organization. So I know what it's like to worry about that bias. Um, I'm curious if, if any of you and, and please, you know, tell me if you've got a hard, hard opinion here, but how can companies leverage technology to minimize the proximity bias? I mean, I can start. I think it really has a lot to do. I mean, technology definitely is a part of it, but I think it has a lot to do with transparency. So we are a completely remote organization as well. <clears throat> we live and die in Asana. Every single thing that needs to be done is in Asana. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I, I think that's really 
really key until we sort of redefine what productivity means, which we definitely should because it doesn't mean the same thing that it did in 1900. Um, until we re sort of define, until we redefine what productivity means, we need to be really transparent about what we're asking for, but also what we're doing so that everybody's on the same page. I'd love to hear what Sophie and Stephanie think. Yeah, and I, I would I would agree with Danny. I think that's true. I, and I think when you, I, you know, when you say transparent, I really think the leadership down, the tops down message and tone is important. Um, if the boss is in the office and others are there and you're not, you know, that that's where, you know, the nerves happen. And so I think as a leader, it's very important to be cognizant that, you know, you're being watched, you know, and and um, and being listened to. So I think, you know, the words are important, you know, reminding people that there is no, you know, one way that fits all and it's okay. And, and you recognize that there's, you know, constantly reminding that that the, the different modes of communication and locations are, are fine. And then I think being conscious of, you know, um, how you know, and it may be intentional if, if, you know, how when you're in the office, it's going to create either others to feel that they are excited and want to come in, but others to also feel a little bit um, uh, left out. And so being aware of that and working on how do you reach out to that group or how do you make sure that there's, and this is all easier said than done because different personalities are going to take the words differently. But I think back to what you were saying earlier, Anna, about, you know, intentionality and awareness. That's where it starts is just knowing that that's going to be an issue um, and, you know, th there's one of my coworkers, you know, who's a leader in the, in the, our group, who's very clear that he thinks you have to be in the office and that's important to him. And he thinks that, you know, it's, it's really, that work has really gone down without it. And, you know, I think he's been very transparent that that's important to him. And so, you know, I think those that probably don't want to, or cannot, come in or not located in the right area will probably look for new roles eventually or have to have a good conversation with him as to why they cannot do it and how are they going to but again he's very transparent about his bias yeah. so you know again it's not that it's wrong he's just being honest and if I could add there too, I think the transparency about your preferences at leader as a leader is going to be important. But then to tie this to specifically to technology, because I get a lot of questions about this in, in my work with people and as editor, um, the tracking software. If if you as a company think that's important, I mean, we're not going to argue that right now. That's a whole other conversation. But if you determine that that's important, then you should be transparent in talking to your people about why that's important and what types of behaviors you are looking for and how you are going to measure success. So that's a that's a really important, I, I think, point for all of us on the line to be thinking about today is, is that transparency and intentionality. Sophie, do you have anything really quick specific that you want to shout out there? Because I've got a great audience question to go to next. Yeah, I think the, the final thing I'd say is um, particularly when it comes to remote work and visibility, um, and I love where the answers have gone, is technology enables remote work in a way that, you know, I think even two years ago, we didn't think was going to be possible on on mass, right? Like the idea of even doing a webinar like this just wasn't possible, um, or it wasn't something that we would, we would all be able to sign up for. And I see we've got people all over the world. But I really think that the light that needs to get shone on sort of a great work from employees and keeping keeping a cohesive team that's that's a people problem rather than a technology problem and it is really important for leaders to ensure that they check themselves with a the proximity bias and also focus on outcomes and so and this is this is how this is how I like to I like to run a team it's about the results and ensuring that you know who's driving the results rather than about FaceTime in an office. And so creating both sort of very intentional moments to showcase individual teams and creating that environment with your managers and their managers. But then also when you do bring people together, thinking really purposefully about it, um, as, as a lot of you said. So yeah, I think this is a human challenge um, in an age of technology. Yeah. And I think that, you know, to reiterate this main point to everybody here today, which is like technology enables the work that's already been done. 
right? The processes that you've set, I've heard that from all three of you, to set those processes, that st strong foundation, that that technology should be enabling that and making that easier, not creating the answers for you necessarily. So I think that's great. So let's go to a question from um, our audience, from Joe Iyer. Um, hopefully I'm saying that last name correct there. Joe, so thanks for this. I think this brings up a really good topic on technology in the workplace today, which is how far do you think that the co-presence offered by virtual reality can help distributed teams feel closer together and collaborate more effectively than on, for example, just video calls? I mean, yeah, I can kick that off. I mean, the well, there's the ideal or the thought of, of the po possibility and then the reality of where we are with, with VR and that kind of technology and, and how it works with, with Wi-Fi and, and things of that nature. But essentially, I mean, what it offers, telepresence is what we're doing today. You know, what uh, co-presence offers is us to feel like we're all in the same room or the same conference hall or whatever it may be. And so as we look at each other, we're actually, you know, through the technology displaced into a room. I think it can be powerful like anything. Um, it would take a while to get used to. Um, but, you know, as we've seen from our own behaviors and, and you know, as Sophie mentioned, we're in a, um, you know, this was impossible two to three years ago and now it feels very normal. Uh, so I, I don't discount that it would be relatively easy to get into, particularly because of the comfort with many of the younger generation with, um, you know, with a, you know, more, you know, um, virtual presence. I will say that the reality, reality of it is still relatively far away because simply of connectivity and that um, we don't own, no one owns the entire end-to-end -end process. So, you know, the last mile is usually where most of the issues are in connectivity. Mm -hmm. And so many homes in different areas um, uh, will have different capabilities um, and, you know, no fault of their own. It, it depends on the provider. So I'm not sure we're there to do it in large scale, but I think as a pilot, you know, and, and in examples of that, it's absolutely worth doing because I think if you could get used to it, you would really feel more present than you would in a one-dimensional environment. Thanks, Stephanie. So I would love to jump in here. I, I, I'm going to disagree just a tiny bit with Stephanie. I think I think sometimes uh, virtual reality is a hammer looking for a nail. It's been around for 30 years and, and it is getting better. And Stephanie mentioned some of the reasons that it hasn't sort of blown up the way that it, that it could. But just because it's there, I don't necessarily think we should use it for every single thing. In the last couple of years, particularly, we've seen some really interesting um, applications. So for example, DE and I training, you actually get to walk in the shoes of somebody else and sort of experience what they're experiencing or public speaking where it can also you know, tell you where you're looking and how often you're looking up and count your number of ums and things like that. I think those are fantastic. I just wonder sometimes if we see a new technology and we're like, oh my gosh, we could apply it to all of these places instead of actually thinking through, you know, is it actually going to be beneficial? Is it worth the effort to go get my, you know, my VR headset and put it on for a meeting? Or is a phone call enough? You know what I mean? So that's kind of where we stand. I think that's great. And it connects back to Danny, what your research has showed that connection is so important and that co, um, you know, that, that co-presence that's the, the question and Stephanie both mentioned, I think is really helpful. The other thing I would point out when it comes to virtual reality, and it goes back to that diversity, equity, and inclusion that we've talked about, which is, you know, really is going to open up when we use it selectively and intentionally, it's really going to open up, I think, freedom from a belonging perspective that I could represent myself in a way that I might not feel comfortable representing myself in the day to day or if I'm remote, you may not even know that I am in a wheelchair every day. I, I'm not. That's just an example, right? There's, there's ways that we can represent ourselves in a virtual world that actually might break down barriers to connection. That's an interesting thought. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. All right, I'm just looking at um, the Q&A that is coming in. I think that's really great. I, I want to, um, Sophie, if I can pull you back in. Um, for a question here, I'm just looking through which one would be, you, you know, a best fit as we, as we look at this, but is there one major breakthrough that we, that we want to acknowledge? Because I, I think we've talked a lot about what we might need to do differently. Is there a breakthrough that, that we might want to acknowledge that has already happened to give a little credit to the people on the phone today that are listening in that says like, 
leverage that, double down on that, right? To, to make sure that we're not uh, moving on to the next thing too quickly. Is there something that you would point out that says like, yes, please double down there? Yeah, I think that um, you know, we, we, under, we, under, we underwent what, 10 years of digital transformation in a matter of months at the start of 2020. And alongside that, we have invested as industries trillions of dollars in new technologies. Um, but where we haven't made the same level of investment is to meet the growing skills gap as a result. And so sort of the big breakthrough um, has been that skills gaps have widened. You know, I talked to a tech exec a couple of weeks ago that said that they could hire every single computer science graduate in the country and still have thousands of open roles. And so whilst we're still seeing the disconnect, I would be thinking about doubling down on new ways to build tech data coding capabilities internally through apprenticeships or other means um, so that we can continue to meet the scale of the challenge ahead so that when the next big digital transformation that we go through um, happens that like we have built enduring companies that, that can meet the scale of that challenge. Yeah, I think so. I think so. S Stephanie, Danny, anything to add or call out there? Okay, good. I, you know, I want to wrap up here with just maybe this general um, quest for innovation that people, so Stephanie, maybe if you want to start with this one, you know, innovation is something that's talked a lot about in companies separate from tech, but certainly when we talk about technology, is there anything specific in the way that we could leverage technology to drive these cultures of innovation that everybody is so keen to have? Yeah, I think absolutely. I think, you know, number one, as we talked about earlier, it's setting up the tools in a way that that can be utilized. Um, so that's step one. And, and and I will shout out to all the IT uh, DMs and CSOs and those. It, it's no small task to make things work in a secure and performant environment. So number one, it's a really, and, and meanwhile, all the other things you're supposed to do, which is a company IT person, take your company into the cloud and get off legacy tools. There are so many things that we're asking of, of these individuals to do in their jobs. And it got a lot more complicated, a lot more quickly. So with that aside, though, you know, the, you know, the, the innovation that we try to we try to bring about is truly letting loose on you know, piloting different uh, opportunities and none of them have to stick. So a lot of new companies are popping up with ways to brainstorm uh, a whiteboard, you know, digitally. Yeah. And so we're piloting that. How does it feel, you know, you know, and, and, and not scaring everyone with a widespread. IT is not going to put that into a system. A company like Intel, we have over 100,000 people globally. You know, when IT puts in something, boy, has it been tested, piloted, you know, et cetera. So, but we do encourage a lot of those pilots for willing people because there's a lot of cool stuff popping up to enable, as Sophie said, the world that transformed overnight. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're trying to say, look, we know that there are people that are more audio oriented, mm -hmm. more video oriented, more artistically oriented. Let's find different ways to see how we can use technology and different apps to pull them out and not say everyone has to do one thing. Um, Okay. So that's been an intel approach. Oh, I love that. Thanks, Stephanie. Danny, anything to add there? Yeah, I kind of want to build on what Stephanie was saying. Uh, don't fall in love with your technology. Mm -hmm. Better stuff is always coming along, so don't fall in love with it. Uh, Vidya Krishnan, who's the CLO at Ericsson, once said, sometimes things, sometimes things just die, and that's okay. So mm -hmm. read your data, figure out what works, get rid of the things that don't, and try something else. Oh, I love that, and I think that's a great note to end on. A huge Okay, we're still recording. Good, good to know. <laughs> I want to give a huge thanks to our sponsor, Intel. Um, you can check out their um, Engineering 4 program. We've dropped that link in the chat um, specifically to Stephanie Halford for your preparation and for your wisdom that you shared today. Danny Johnson for the research and the connection to your companies and Sophie Ruddick for that inspiration around the apprentice model and the skills from roles. That is one of my big takeaways. I can't wait to see what that does to change the world of work and make business better. So I appreciate all of you for joining us and listening in today, whether it's live or on the recording, I'm wishing all of you peace and progress. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.